be turning to Revelation chapter 16, and I'm going to ask Jim Davis just to remain seated where he is and lead us in prayer, please. <coughs> Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the day that you've blessed us with. We're so thankful, Father, for the opportunity we have as thy children to gather together and to study thy word and share it in truth. We're thankful for the teachers, Father. We're thankful for Earl and for his knowledge of thy word. We pray that you'll be in such a way that we'll understand it and apply it to our lives, that we'll truly grow in grace and knowledge by the fact that we say in Jesus Christ that we study. Help us all to do thy will. Amen. Chapter 16, the seven bowls of wrath. Look at uh, the end of verse 1 of chapter 16. The seven bowls of the wrath of God will be poured out upon the earth. Let's read those first verses. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So that the first angel went and pointed poured out his bowl on the earth, and it became a loathsome and a, a malignant sore on the people who had the uh, mark of the beast and who worshipped his image. Wrath. What is wrath? Anger. <coughs> yeah, well, yeah. Extreme anger. Probably extreme anger. It's an emotion, isn't it? Something you feel. When you feel wrath, is it for or against? against? Against. And this is God's feeling against evil in the world. And quite frequently, we need to keep in mind that sometimes when uh, the term wrath in the Bible comes to stand for punishment, since it is evil and God's against it, wrath means God's wrath is poured out on him, means he's punishing them. In fact, if you will look at uh, Romans 2 for just a moment, you might want to turn over there and just listen to Romans 2 and verse 4. Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience? Here is God being patient and tolerant with us, wanting to help us. Then we just, it's a triviality to us. We take it lightly. Jesus died for me, but who cares? Take it lightly. Well, what happens when that happens? When we act like that? Uh, lightly of his riches, of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God ought to lead you to what? Repentance. Repentance. Change of life. Turning back to God. But because you don't, look at verse 5, because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up what? Up there you go. Every day we go and ignore the, the sacrifice of Jesus and what he's done for us and God's loving kindness expressed to us. Every day we go without accepting it and acting like it's a triviality. The pile of wrath that's going to come down on us is getting higher and higher and higher and higher. <clears throat> now what's wrath then? Punishment. It is the punishment that comes from the, the anger or the wrath of God. And so that punishment is getting higher. And in the day of judgment, it will come down on us and crush us. That's the idea of the wrath of God. In fact, he's storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath. What's the day of wrath? Judgment. Judgment. Now, is it a day of wrath for everybody? Just for the unbelievers. Just yes, for unbelievers, those who don't accept, those who don't do what is right. Instead, it's a day of great rejoicing for those who live right and do right. We are in Revelation 16, verses 1 and following. For those of you just coming in, we're talking about the bowls of wrath, the seven bowls of wrath. Wrath being then basically God's punishment. It comes from his emotion against evil, and it's God's punishment. Now, will you please notice that uh, I heard a voice there in verse 1 of chapter 16. I heard a voice coming from the temple. Well, the real temple is in heaven. And uh, 
you're going to pour out, that is, remember the old temple was in Jerusalem, but the true temple of God is in heaven. Remember, we saw that in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, and elsewhere. Uh, and so it's, you hear the voice from heaven, the temple in heaven, saying to those seven angels that are obviously in heaven, go and pour out the wrath on the earth. God is going to punish the inhabitants of the earth, not the globe, but the inhabitants of the earth. So, in fact, if you look back at chapter 15, and about verses 1 and following, you'll find that We've already talked about it, that these are God's last efforts to try to get Rome and, and uh, the people of the empire to repent. Uh, in fact, uh, then I saw another sign on heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who have seven plagues, which are the last, because in them the wrath of God is finished. So these are the last efforts to get Rome and the em people of the empire to repent. Uh, it's the last warning to Rome. And so the first angel went, and he poured out his bowl, literal bowl. Is it a literal bowl like you have in the kitchen? No. All these are symbols. We've talked about it several times before. And we'll talk about it more in this, so it's not a literal bowl. And you, you don't literally pour out God's punishment but it's as if it were poured out. And this time it's poured out, if you look at verse 2, it's poured out on the earth, that is on the land. It's poured out against and it's punishing all those who do what? Evil. Well, yes, but look specifically in verse 2. <laughs> what does it say? It's poured out on those who do what? Worship, Worship the image of the beast. Yes those who are bowing down to the evil dictates of the emperor and are worshiping, worshiping the emperors and the idols and all that go along with it. So it's against the beast worshipers. There's a great deal of uh, punishment going on there. And it became a loathsome and malignant sore. What's malignant mean? Maybe it won't get no better. That's... It means it may kill you. When you have, can you're diagnosed with, uh, you go in and you have a growth in your neck or something, and they say it's benign, and you smile. And you say it's malignant. You say, when they say it's malignant, you say, this is serious. Serious punishment. And so it's poured out <clears throat> on the land, on the earth this time. That's the first angel, first bowl of wrath. Look at the second angel, verse 3. Poured out the bowl, pretty obviously on the same people, into the sea. So not the land this time, but the sea. That's implied it's against the same beast worshipers. It's against the same evil people. The same people that advocate emperor worship. And do not bow down to Jesus and do not serve him. So here it's the sea. Now look at the third angel in verse 4. And the third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of waters, and they became blood. So you go from the land to the sea and out of the rivers. And if you look at it, it's being poured out against, the punishment is against those, verse 6, who spilled the blood of the saints and prophets. Well, who is that? Who are those that spilled the blood of the saints and prophets? Well, the empire, the emperors, they're decreeing you have to worship them. But eventually decreed, particularly in the 300s, we'll read it again today, that you can't worship the Lord. You've got to renounce him or be killed or be exiled. And so this punishment is against them. It will come against those who are involved in that sort of thing. They spilled, they even killed. We read in chapter 2 and verse 13 about one martyr. There's indication that there are many more. Chapter 6 and verse 10 said there would be many more. The number had to be fulfilled, completed. There would be many more martyrs of the Christian cause, that is, saints and prophets. And it's interesting, they poured out the blood of the saints and prophets, and now they're forced to do what? Look at verse 6.
What are these evil people forced to do? Verse 6. Drink blood. All the sources of water are bloody now. Remind you of one of the plagues in Egypt, doesn't it? <clears throat> They're forced to drink blood. Do you remember anything back in the early part of our study? Do you remember what the first martyrs had cried out to the Lord and asked him? Lord, how long is it going to be before you do what? Avenge. Avenge the blood of the martyrs. And he said, wait. Chapter 6, verse 11. It's going to get worse before it gets better. But I will avenge. Here he is avenging against Rome. <clears throat> verse 8. You have the fourth of the angels. And here the sun. Fourth angel poured out his bowl upon the sun. And it was given... It, it was given to it to scorch men with fire. Obviously, again, that's against the disobedient people of the Roman Empire. Look at verse 9. It's against those who didn't repent. Uh, by the way, this is not the end of time because at the end of time, it'll be too late to repent. There won't be any repentance then. Any true repentance, there won't be any forgiveness. But these people had a chance to repent, but they didn't. So it's not the end of time. And so the sun does evil to them, hurts them in some way. God uses the sun to scorch them. Maybe burn up their crops or other things. We're not told exactly what. But we know he uses it to punish them. Uh, I want you to now... Can you remember back in chapter 8, verses 7 and following? It's interesting that we had similar punishments back there against Rome. But if you look at chapter 8, verses 7 and following, a third of the land was smitten, and a third of the seas were smitten, and a third of the rivers was smitten, and the sun also was used to smite a third. But all there, that was a third. That was less severe. But now here, in these verses that we're dealing with right now, chapter 16, verses 1 and following here, all of the land and sea and rivers and sun, it's not partial any longer, indicates the destruction of Rome is coming. It's happening. Uh, God is going to make Rome see her evil and punish her for the evil she has done. Now, throughout the history of the Roman Empire, you will note that there were many natu uh, natural disasters that did smite parts of them. And that contributed to Rome's fall. There were earthquakes, there were floods, there were volcanic eruptions, there were fires, there were winds, things of that nature. And God is saying, I will bring down the persecutor, and natural disasters will be one of the means I use. I use, says God. That's what he'd been saying back in chapter 8. Now, here it's final. The whole of Rome is going to be brought down. The whole of Rome is going to be destroyed. Look now in verse 10. Do you have any questions or comments up to verse 10? We're in Revelation 16, 10. All right, look at 16, 10 and read it with me. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became darkened and they gnawed their tongues because of pain. Very interesting. The throne of the beast, of course, is Rome. The beast is situated in Rome. And all of Rome became darkened. Do you remember anything about the plagues in Egypt? There was one of them that, where darkness came upon the land, remember? Scared the people to death. That's in Exodus 10, verse 21. And again, this is against the disobedient, against Rome and the people that are perpetrating all this persecution against Christians. But did that darkness in this case cause any repentance? Look at verse 11. Well, look at verse 10 a little more first. Did you see how severe some of their punishment was? They even, they gnawed their tongues because of pain. That's pretty severe. But they didn't repent. Look at 11. Instead of repenting, they blasphemed the God of heaven. They spoke out against him. They reviled him. 
they did not repent of their deeds. Now look at verse 12. You have the sixth angel. By the way, back in chapter 9 and verse 1, we had noticed that Rome would be harmed because of evil within, within its own system. Because you had so much immorality. You even had emperors killing sons and, and uncles because they feared they would take away their power, that sort of thing. Gibbon has written a history of the Roman <clears throat> Empire. Uh, you probably are aware of it. I have it in my library. And he gives ample evidence that a lot of what caused Rome to fall was the immorality from within. Uh, if America falls, and there is danger, one of the reasons will be immorality from within. The family is crumbling. Families are no longer, people are no longer in a family faithful to one another. And you have all sorts of immorality. And so that evil from within causes a loss of stability. And uh, you probably remember that the Proverbs writer, Brother Tom is studying the Proverbs with us on Wednesday night now, Tom and Jeff. And you probably remember something he said about uh, what evil will do for a nation. First place, <laughs> what does righteousness do for a nation? It exalts it. But what does evil do? It will tear it down. It will undermine its moorings. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. So that's what's happening to Rome. So it comes against the disobedient. Well, look at the sixth angel, verse 12 of chapter 16. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. It's interesting, you need to keep in mind that, uh, by the way, this repeats some of what had been said in Revelation 9, verses 14 and following. It repeats it and emphasizes it again. I put this map out here. I know you can't see everything, but you'll be able to see something. The Roman Empire, obviously the base of it was here at Rome, but it extended clear over here to Spain, to the Mediterranean Sea. It went clear across here. It went clear the Euphrates River was known as the eastern boundary right in here. By the way, if you go, I've mentioned this before, I think, and look at the uh, ruins of the old Roman Forum in Rome, they have a big map up there. The, the Roman Empire had its greatest expanse. And it went clear over to here. This was the eastern border, the Euphrates River. It went here, clear up into England, way up into here. And it went clear down into North Africa. It was one of the greatest kingdoms that has ever existed in the history of the world. Physical, material kingdoms. It thought it was invincible. Nobody could ever bring it down. And many of the people that were citizens of it thought that. Now, watch out. The, the, the Euphrates is dried up. And what does the text say it was dried up? Why was the reason it's being dried up? <coughs> yeah, look at verse 12 and let's read it again. Dried up so that the way would be prepared for the kings from the east. Ah, even some, some of the people that have been in subjection to the Roman Empire are going to come against her now. And are going to fight against her. Again, repeating some of the material. In fact, you see God's plan here for destroying Rome. Some of the ones that came in came from the east. In fact, they came over through here from upper Europe up in here and came down and came down through here also. But others came from the east. But that's symbolic. It's not saying all of them are going to come across the Euphrates. It's simply saying the kings are going to come and they're going to destroy Rome. God's plan is that Rome will be destroyed. We've already talked about the Huns and the Visigoths and all of those who came in and helped and did incursions against Rome and finally she fell in 476. But now let's notice, notice the very next verse. Verse 13, And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole earth to gather them together for the war of the great day of, the God, of, God, of God the Almighty. Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake 
and keeps his clothes so that he will not walk about naked and men will not see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place which in Hebrew is called Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon it's sometimes referred to <coughs> as being. Well, the dragon is about to fall. But the dragon, Satan, and the first beast, the Roman Empire, and the second beast, the emperor worship. Remember, we identified <coughs> The emperor worship the second beast is also called the false prophet. We've seen that. All of this, this evil conglomeration, this evil alliance is about to fall. But they're not going to fall without fight. And so they have a plan. God has a plan to destroy them. But they're getting together a plan in order to resist God. And there's going to be this great cl clash. All of these forces against God's plan to destroy them. Now, verse three or 13. The dragon and the two beasts send three unclean spirits like frogs out of their mouths, evidently to organize their forces of evil. <coughs> By the way, they are unclean spirits. <coughs> and will you notice verse 14 of demons? 16, 14, for they are spirits of demons. I had never noticed in the first years of my study of all of this, I'd never noticed that uh, demonology is frequently involved and is connected with idolatry. The demons of the underworld that are under Satan evidently use idols as a part of their plan to, to uh, uh, subvert God's plan in the world. <coughs> I got to looking at that several years ago and I found a passage back in Deuteronomy that was interesting. When the people of Israel had uh, uh, gone away from God and started worshiping idols too, in Deuteronomy 32 and verse 17, the aspired Moses says, they sacrificed to demons who were not God, to gods whom they have not known. He was talking about idols clearly in the context. And he says he connects the demons with the idols. The demons in the, of the underworld, Satan's demons, Satan's evil angels, are using the idols to subvert God's plan. And so you have demonology involved here too. And all of this, of course, the Roman Empire as a whole worshipped idols and worshipped even as we've already seen. But like frogs out of their mouths, it's interesting when you think of uh, demons and doctrines of demons. Remember Paul said in 1 Timothy 4.1 that toward the end of time there would be doctrines of demons. And uh, again, demonology and, and idols are connected together. But notice now they're going to send out, send out frogs, verse 13. And here is a good comment I thought by Brother Stafford North that I told you I'm following somewhat in this course of studies. Actually, I've departed from it quite a bit. But uh, Brother Stafford North says, first of all, we must recognize that this is a passage filled with highly symbolic images. A dragon who is not really a dragon meets with two beasts that are not really beasts. And they send out frogs who are not really frogs out of their mouths, which are not really mouths. <clears throat> all symbolic. All emblems of something. Now what could the, <clears throat> we suggested that uh, the beast Satan, the dragon Satan, and the first beast, the Roman Empire, and the second beast, the emperor worship, sometimes also called false prophet. All of them are getting their efforts, putting their efforts together, and frogs come out of their mouths. What are these frogs? Well, we don't know, excepting that we know that they're messengers that are trying to gather together all the forces of evil against God's plan to destroy the Roman Empire because of their wickedness. And uh, uh, that's, that's certainly true. And these... Uh, Possibly these frogs that are sent out are some of the edicts that went out from the Roman emperors. One of the worst ones that we've quoted one time before was uh, the one that went out in the time of Diocletian, the emperor Diocletian, who uh, lived around the year 300. And here's one of the edicts that he sent out. In fact, here's an account of it that's found in the historian uh, Eusebius. It was the 15th year of the reign of Diocletian, uh, and uh, on the month Dystrus, 
called by the Romans March, in which the festival of our Savior's passion was at hand, when the imperial edicts uh, were everywhere published. And the edicts said, they commanded, to tear down the churches to the foundation, church buildings, that is, to destroy the sacred scriptures by fire, and which commanded also those who were in honorable station should be degraded, and those that were freedmen, that is, those Christians that were freedmen, should be deprived of their liberty, and if they per persevered in their adherence to Christianity, if they insisted going ahead and worshiping Christ, uh, then they would be punished. The first edict against us was of, th of this nature, but not long before other edicts were also issued in which it was ordered that all the prelates, that would be the like elders in the church, all the prelates in every place should first be committed to prison and then by every artifice constrained to offer sacrifice to the gods, the gods being the idols. And if they didn't, they were frequently put to death. They were made martyrs. Now, possibly these frogs, which are not really frogs, are these edicts which went out from the emperor. Now, he says these evil people also perform signs. They're serving evil purposes, so they've got to be false miracles. What kind of signs were they? Well, do you have anything in the Bible, the text of the Bible itself, that mentions some people that were performing things that seemed, that really impressed people, that weren't real signs, however? Do you remember anything like that? Simon the sorcerer? Remember in Acts 8, verse 10? Boy, they thought this guy was something. They thought he was a god. Until the evangelist came along and performed the real sign. And then Simon wanted to buy his powers because he saw they were real powers. Remember that? Well, here's some of the use of false signs. Back in uh, the time of Moses, Paul will identify, and the Timothy correspondence to Timothy identifies two men called Jannes and Jambres. What they do? Moses. They withstood Moses. Withstood yeah. And they did. They looked like some just real good, it looked like miracles. Well, they, they, they were miracles. They were something you and I couldn't do. But uh, did God upstage them? Yeah. Remember, they cast down their uh, staff and it became a serpent. But what happened to their serpent? <laughs> Aaron's the serpent ate it up. God always upstages the false miracles by doing greater signs than they. But the Roman emperor, and it looked like they did some signs that were, they were impressive. In fact, uh, maybe ventriloquy. Uh, in fact, archaeologists have dug up some evidence that uh, in some of the pagan altars where they were asking Christians to go and put a pinch of incense on the altar, they've dug up uh, indications of uh, tubes where they were projecting their voice from back rooms down through the tube and it made it seem like the idol was talking. Further, I've mentioned to you already, I think, that uh, in Sicily, while I was doing mission work there, the Roman Catholic priests wanted to have a statue of Mary that was bleeding and uh, really impressed people to make them bow down to Mary and make them be Roman Catholics. And, well, on one occasion in the city of Palermo, where I lived for four years, they found a tube where the blood was being piped out through from the, from the church out to the statue. Uh, that has been known to be, those are fake miracles, not real miracles. Now, remember the frog-like messengers, these edicts, I think? They sent out their edicts to the kings of the whole world. The whole world had been, many of these kings had been in subjection to the emperor at Rome. Whatever he said, they did. And he tries to call them together to war against and to put down Christians and be sure if they're in your empire that you kill them, that you burn down their churches and you take away their scriptures and you do all that. And uh, so there's war between God and his forces and the forces of evil. Verse 14, look at it. Mentions here the great day of God. 
For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole earth to gather them together for the war of the great day of God. This great day of God is very interesting. Uh, day of the Lord sometimes. Sometimes when the day of the Lord is mentioned like in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 2, you're talking about the one at the end of time when there will be no more history at all. That's the uh, day of God of all days of God. But also, sometimes in Scripture, you need to take into account that there can be days of the Lord within history, not at the end of history, but within history. Let me give you one example. Amos 5 and verse 8. Amos lived about 800 before Christ. And he says to the people of his time who thought they were doing pretty well and they, they thought God was going to come and bless them and it was going to be a great day of life. And... Uh, Amos said, no, you're hypocrites. You're not really serving him. You're just acting like it. And he says, alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord. Get that phrase? You who are longing for the day of the Lord. What purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. He's not coming to bless you because you're not obedient. He's coming to do what? Punish you. But that's within history. That's 800 years before Christ. Certainly not the end of history. So sometimes a day of the Lord is within history. And uh, that's true of this particular one here. Uh, but as the final day, the final day we know from a lot of teaching by, on the part of Jesus, Matthew 24 and elsewhere, there will be a lot of people in the final day that will be unprepared, right? And so this day of the Lord is being talked about here. There will be a lot of people that will be unprepared. It's going to come like a thief. You're not generally prepared for a thief, are you? You don't expect him at the hour he comes. He doesn't send a message and say, I'm going to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning. You better stay up and get your gun. <clears throat> That's not the way thieves operate. And so a lot of people will be unprepared. In fact, look at verse 15. It's going to be as if they were naked. Uh, you're not prepared when you're still naked. You need to put your clothes on before you do anything. But now look at verse 16. Look at the, you're, you're building to a great war between the, the forces of good, the forces of Christianity, God's forces, and these, the Roman Empire, and the, the emperors, and Satan who's behind them, and idolatry and all of that. There's a great war that's building between the two. And uh, look at where it's going to be. Since it's a symbolic war, and since the dragons are symbolic, and the frogs are symbolic, you would not expect a literal place you would expect a figurative place. And that figurative place is Armageddon. Armageddon. However, it, it, uh, there is some... Let, let me see if I can illustrate it by using... you remember what Waterloo is? W-A-T-E-R-L-O-O. -O. What's that? That's where Napoleon was finally defeated in 1815 in Europe when he... Had, uh, when he had conquered nearly all of Europe, but finally Wellington and others, the, the English General Wellington and others got enough forces together, they finally defeated him and he met his Waterloo. And now, uh, anybody that is defeated, you quite frequently will say, he met his Waterloo. Is it a literal Waterloo? By the way, the first Waterloo was a little town. I believe it was in Belgium, if you check it out. But when you say Hitler met his Waterloo, it doesn't mean it was at that little town, does it? It means it was his final defeat. He was put down. So keep that in mind. That's the kind of thing we're going to see as we look at Armageddon. In fact, Armageddon, and here, let's see, if I can look at I can tell you where the literal it is. All right, here is Megiddo. I visited it. And here Solomon had some of his fortresses and horses and war, and there were a lot of battles that were conducted right in this area. It was called the Plain of Israelon. Or it was sometimes called in Scripture, it's sometimes called the Plain of Megiddo also. 
And so Armageddon uh, would translate literally the Mount of Megiddo. And it's a famous site that I just indicated to you. It was the location of a fortress built first, I believe, by Solomon. He had a large, out, large outpost there. But also you have, it's the place where King Ahab fought. It was the site of many famous battles. Deborah and her forces defeated Sisera there. And Gideon with his 300 defeated the Midianites. And that's where Saul and Jonathan tried to defeat the Philistines, but they lost. They were killed. Famous battleground. King Ahaziah died in battle there. And the good king Josiah in about 612, as I recall, died there when he fought against the Egyptians. So it is a famous, very famous, the most famous battleground. And it's put for a final titanic struggle. Here's the final place, not a literal place. It's the final struggle against the evil of the Roman Empire and idol worship and Satan being behind idol worship with his demons all of that against God and the forces of Christianity. And so it's the conclusion of God's final battle against Rome. By the way, the place where it's called the Plain of Megiddo, this plain right here outside of Megiddo, uh, is Second Chronicles 35 and verse 22. But that's what we're building up to. And now watch what happens. The seventh angel. We're talking about the seven bowls of wrath. We're in verse 17. <clears throat> then the seventh angel poured out his bowl upon the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and there was a great earthquake such as there has not been since man came upon the earth. So great an earthquake was it. And so mighty that the great city was split into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the great was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island fled away from a mountain, and the, and the mountains were not found. And the huge hailstones uh, above the hundred, about a hundred pounds, each came down from heaven upon men. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, because its plague was extremely <coughs> severe. So you have the final bowl of the wrath of God. Notice the loud voice is from the throne. What throne? God's throne. And it says, it is done. We've been warring for all these years, decades, and maybe centuries, and now it's over. And following that, there is a, a great proclamation accompanied by lightning and thunder and earthquakes, earthquakes such as has never been, have never been seen. And then, verse 19, the great city, back up in chapter 17 and verse 9, we found it was built on seven mountains, <laughs> was split into three parts, and was left in ruins. And the cities of the nations that made up the empire, and I told you it went from east to west and north to south, hundreds and thousands of miles, and all of them mourned. And Rome was remembered for its evil. As a matter of fact, God doesn't forget when you do good. And he doesn't forget when you do evil. Unless you repent of it, then he'll forget it and blot it out. But that's what happened. Uh, and Babylon the Great is remembered before God. Romans, the 14th chapter, verses 10 and following. Uh, by the way, this is not the end of time. <clears throat> Let me emphasize that again. Because in the end of time, here, remember, all of them still are blaspheming at the end of the war. But at the end of time, that's not going to happen. In Romans 14, verses 10 and following, but you who do... Uh, but you, why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Now what's going to happen in the final judgment seat of God? Well, we find in Romans 14 and verse 11, For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. Even evil people will give praise to God. Their tongues will not be blaspheming at the end of time. 
They still are at this end, but it's an end within history. It's a day of the Lord within history, not one at the end of history. It's interesting. This They are still blaspheming God, verse 21. And in that, that the cup of the wine of God's wrath is poured out. We read the destruction that's described, verses 20 through 21. By the way, that's a good example of apocalyptic literature. In apocalyptic literature we studied already, there is exaggeration for effect, purposed exaggeration, cataclysmic events that you couldn't imagine, violent events, and all of that is for emphasis. And now the unshakable kingdom, they thought, greatest kingdom in, in human history. They had more expanse and, and rule over the world than America does today. It has fallen. Nobody <coughs> will ever fall. But it fell. Have you ever noticed how in Scripture, quite frequently, you talk about the shakable and the unshakable kingdom? Let's go to Hebrews. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, verses 25 and following. The Hebrews writer says, See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those who did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will they escape who turn away from him who warns them from heaven. By the way, this is Rome has been warned from heaven. Now look at verse 26 of Hebrews 12. And his voice shook the earth then, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. All human kingdoms can be shaken. God is powerful enough, and God will remember when we do evil, and we, we continue on an evil course. He will shake those kingdoms. He will cause them to fall. Now watch the contrast in Hebrews 12 and verse 28. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us, show, let us show gratitude by which we offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Rome thought it would shake Christianity. It thought it would put it out of existence. It thought it would exterminate it. After all, they're going to put them in prison and even kill them. Martyrs. They would learn. They would go and sacrifice to the demons, uh, the idols and the demons, by putting that pinch on the altar. They would shake Christianity. Guess who gets shaken? Rome. And she falls in utter ruin. And from 476 AD on, there never has really been a kingdom that was strong in Rome or in Italy because the Roman Empire with all of her power, human power went against God who is all powerful and she was shaken to her very foundations and even the foundations cracked questions or comments by the way here, the storyline, basically, of the Revelation letter ends. 610, uh, how long before you avenge, O Lord? You have it here now. Here's the end. Prophesy. It will happen. And it did happen in 476 AD. So the storyline ends, and as somebody as well said, the rest of it is kind of icing on the cake. The rest of the Revelation letter will tell us what happens to the good people who stay faithful and uh, will re-emphasize the, the destruction of the great heart that we'll deal with the next, but will emphasize mainly the glorification of people who remain faithful. Any questions or comments before we close here at the end of chapter 16? All right, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.